over two million American tax dollars funneled to China. On the receiving end, an arm of the Chinese military and the Wuhan lab that many are debating could have leaked COVID-19. A new report is diving into the details. What do you think? Let us know below and subscribe if you haven't already. This program is brought to you by Preserve Gold, the number one precious metals IRA provider. Call 855-962-3322. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Over $2 million in taxpayer funding draining from your wallet into China's. And that destination includes an arm of the Chinese military. As for what the money was used for, research in infections ranging from coronaviruses to swine influenza. Let's zoom in. A new report is breaking down details on how $2 million tax dollars went to China and how they were used to study infections, including coronaviruses. The money flow happens between 2014 and 2021, ending two years after the pandemic broke out. The report comes from GAO, a nonpartisan government agency that investigates federal spending. An arm of the Chinese military received over 500,000 tax dollars from Duke University, which got the money from the NIH. The Chinese military institution used the money for research on the transmission of the swine influenza virus, known as swine flu, to humans. Next up is Wuhan University. It received over 200,000 from EcoHealth Alliance and over 39,000 from UC Davis, which received the funds from the U.S. Agency for International Development, or USAID. The federal agency is tasked with giving out foreign aid. The controversial Wuhan lab, called the Wuhan Institute of Virology, got the lion's share, over $1.4 million. The lab has been the subject of an intense debate over whether it leaked the CCP virus, which causes COVID-19. The virus took the lives of over 1 million Americans. The lab received almost 600,000 tax dollars from EcoHealth Alliance Funds, a nonprofit in New York. This organization received the money from the National Institutes of Health, the largest source of funding for medical research in the U.S. Another $800,000 came from the University of California, Davis, which got the money from USAID. GAO investigated the cash flow at the request of two congressmen, Mike Turner, chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, and Brad Wenstrup. Both lawmakers said they would continue to take concrete actions to declassify intelligence related to the pandemic. Developments on Cuba reportedly pulled from highly classified U.S. intelligence. A new Chinese military training ground could be moving into Florida's backyard. China and Cuba are working out the details to build a joint facility there, just a hundred miles from the Sunshine State. If it happens, Beijing's troops and military operations could end up stationed there. The Wall Street Journal reported the development Tuesday, citing current and former U.S. officials as saying the details aren't complete yet, but they are convincing. Negotiations for the facility are reportedly far along, but a deal hasn't been inked. In response, China's foreign ministry spokesperson Mao Ning said Beijing is not aware of any such plan. The news comes just days after reports alleged that the two countries had agreed to build an eavesdropping site in Cuba. After that, the White House revealed multiple Chinese intel gathering sites have operated in the country since at least 2019. Back to the planned training ground, officials noted the project falls under Beijing's Project 141, a Chinese military directive to expand its overseas network of military bases and support. The Cuba facility would become the first Project 141 site in the Western Hemisphere. In a Monday interview, Secretary of State Blinken said he brought up China's activities in Cuba during his visit to Beijing over the weekend, noting the U.S. has always had concerns about a possible Chinese base there. The White House declined to comment. The Wall Street Journal noted the Biden administration has contacted Cuban officials about the plan. Texas is leading the fight against what many are calling a crime against humanity. On Sunday, the governor signed the first anti-forced organ harvesting law in the U.S. Entity spoke to one lawmaker who paved the way for the bill's passage into law. Let's zoom in. Texas will not, will not tolerate this barbaric practice. Texas is now home to the first anti-forced organ harvesting law in the U.S., 
Governor Greg Abbott on Sunday signed Senate Bill 1040, sponsored by State Senator Lois Kolkhorst. It's accompanied by an identical House bill, sponsored by Representative Tom Oliverson. Uh, Republicans and Democrats standing together from across Texas saying this is wrong. The law will ban health insurance plans from covering organ transplants in which the organs come from countries that allow forced organ harvesting, especially China. Oliverson hopes they can end transplant tourism in China by cutting off the money supply from health insurance companies. Hospitals in China that were advertising things like uh, get your heart transplant here, donors standing by. And as a doctor, I knew instantly that you cannot be standing by to donate your heart unless you're standing by to surrender your life. Investigations by human rights groups show that the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, has been forcefully taking organs from prisoners of conscience, including people of faith such as house Christians and Uyghur Muslims. The main targets of forced organ harvesting practice Falun Gong, also known as Falun Dafa. It's a faith group with tens of millions of practitioners that's faced relentless persecution in China since 1999. They're no longer a person, they're just a commodity. They're just a, they're just a way for the government to make money, to monetize. You can't go over to China and make this stop right now, but I can make sure that Texans aren't able to participate in this evil, detestable practice. Oliverson says the law will start a national conversation for the U.S. to take a strong stance against the CCP's human rights abuses. Reporting by Chi Huin, NTD News. Good news for Washington, India is boosting its alliance with the U.S. as China ups its aggression. India's prime minister is on his way to Washington, and President Biden is expected to receive him with high honor. He's set to address Congress and attend a White House state dinner. It's the kind of diplomatic treatment usually reserved for treaty allies. Many are also eyeing whether India will be able to secure critical U.S. defense technology. India has often asked for high-end technology and the U.S. normally only gives it to its uh, closest security partners and allies and sometimes not even them. So to give it to a country which is not a security ally, which has had long relationship with Russia on the military front, uh, means that you are, that you trust that country enough and are willing to share your technology with them in the defense realm, not just the civilian realm. So it matters. Why is Washington eager to court India? The country is critical for U.S. efforts to counter China. So critical that an expert says India's choice on who to side with could help determine the winner of the U.S.-China battle for dominance. India has a lot of say um, and soft power in the global south. A part of the world that the United States does not have as much of say or soft power in anymore. India is a major U.S. defense partner in Asia. The country is a nuclear power, the most populous country in the world, and occupies a strategic location. On its west is the Strait of Hormuz. On its east lies the Strait of Malacca. Both are critical pathways for transporting energy. As for how the U.S. should treat India, John Sidalides, U.S. State Department diplomacy consultant and geopolitical strategist, had this to say. And India, I believe, will never see itself as a quote-unquote junior partner or ally of the United States the way many countries see, for instance, the members of the NATO alliance. Uh, it will be taken seriously as an equal partner on the world stage, and it will maintain a very independent foreign policy, working with countries like the U.S., Japan, Australia, to check China's ambitions when they affect and impact India's national sovereignty and territorial integrity. So we need to navigate this relationship very carefully and be very respectful of Indian national interests and not expect India to follow America's direction every time. But India won't be easy to win over. Although it's a member of a security alliance to counter China called the Quad, it also joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. China and Russia lead the group, which aims to push back on U.S. influence. But India has its own bitter history with China. Relations between the two took a deep dive after border conflicts in 2020. 20 Indian soldiers died in the skirmish, along with an unconfirmed number of Chinese troops. Meanwhile, India has refused to condemn Russia for its invasion of Ukraine. Moscow remains its top defense supplier, but there might be a shift incoming. 
Earlier this month, Pentagon Chief Lloyd Austin traveled to India. Both sides announced they would kickstart a project to speed up defense cooperation. It remains to be seen if the visit would turn the tide in U.S.-India relations and what deals could be announced. We'll keep you updated as the situation develops. Did the U.S. and China reach any breakthroughs after Washington's top diplomat visited Beijing? From President Biden to China experts, we're hearing mixed opinions. Here are a few of them. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken just concluded his closely watched trip to China. President Biden praised his efforts, though the actual progress and impacts of the trip remain unclear. While in Beijing, Blinken brought up one of Washington's biggest concerns, China's military moves. But the Chinese side refused to discuss it. According to Blinken's interview with CBS, the State Department will keep working on the military aspect. How does China see the trip? Chinese Communist Party head Xi Jinping noted that the U.S. and China, as the world's two largest economic powers, need to build up what he called generally stable ties. He added that some agreements were reached, but didn't disclose further details. Next to Washington's relatively optimistic response, some experts believe the U.S.-China meeting highlighted weaknesses on the U.S. side. Gordon Chang told Newsmax that, in his view, Washington's desperate attempts to talk with China suggest the U.S. is losing ground. A former U.S. Air Force general echoed that message. You know, we asked for this meeting. We asked for the opportunity to send Secretary Blinken. Um, we have been basically begging the Chinese to give us access to their military so we can have military to military dialogue. Again, I think we have just really lost the ball on what is important with the relationship. He interpreted the conversation as a low-level, mild talk. In fact, Biden, the Biden administration has been backtracking recently and saying, hey, we're going to reset relationships, our relationship with China. That's a, that's a bad thing for America. That's not indicating that we're going to build our infrastructure, we're going to build our industrial base, and we're going to actually protect our economy from China. That's what they should be focused on, not this low-level, mill-to-mill talks. It remains to be seen how U.S.-China relations will develop following Blinken's visit. We'll keep you updated. Cutting-edge chips are in high demand for Apple and other U.S. tech companies. So the world's number one chipmaker, Taiwan's TSMC, is making significant strides. That's by venturing into the testing phase of designing a 2 nanometer manufacturing process, capable of producing the globe's most advanced chip technology. According to Taiwanese financial newspaper Commercial Times, TSMC has recently initiated preparations to begin trial production for the 2 nanometer products in collaboration with two American tech giants, Apple and NVIDIA. Apple has reportedly secured a majority share, approximately 90 percent, in TSMC's 3 nanometer supply. That says TSMC continues to play a crucial role in the global economy. Though concerns have been mounting over certain risks, military threats or disruptions from China could affect TSMC's operations. And because of it, could pose significant implications for NVIDIA and Apple and the U.S. technology industry as a whole. China is getting a lead in quantum tech by tapping into Western research institutes. That's with the aim to boost its military projection, something experts say may further erode human rights. A recent probe sheds light on years of partnership between Beijing and a top German university. Let's dive in. For two decades, Germany's oldest university, Heidelberg, has been the cradle of quantum research in China. That's according to an investigation by German newspaper Deutsche Welle and nonprofit news agency Corrective. Central to the probe is Pan Jianwei, a man now known as the father of quantum in China. Pan is a student of Nobel Prize winning physicist Anton Zellinger and a co-founder of Quantum SeaTech. The startup was added to Washington's sanction list in 2021, allegedly for trying to obtain U.S. know-how to back the Chinese Communist Party's military. In 2003, Pan joined Heidelberg University to set up his own lab and research team while retaining close contact with his alma mater, the University of Science and Technology of China, or USTC. During his stay in Heidelberg, Pan received funding from Europe, totaling about $4 million. In 2008, he brought his lab and research back to USTC, leading to groundbreaking advances in China's quantum communications. 
Those include the launch of the world's first quantum satellite into space. Quantum communication, widely used in cell phones and navigation devices, also has great military potential, as in espionage and surveillance. A 2019 report by U.S. security firm Strider revealed USTC and PON's broad ties to China's defense sector. The report described Heidelberg University as arguably the most important foreign partner behind China's rapid progress in dual-use quantum technologies. Beyond that, PON's company Quantum SeaTech maintains a presence in China's northwestern Xinjiang province. Police files leaked last year reveal photos of thousands of Uyghurs detained in the region. Experts fear quantum SeaTech could further tighten the regime's grip on Xinjiang, making future leaks less likely. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for two years. Here's what to look out for in our second half. From spy bases to troops stationed 90 miles of the U.S. coast, what kind of leverage does China's presence in Cuba have over the U.S.? This comes on the heels of Secretary of State Antony Blinken's visit in Beijing with Xi Jinping. As for how our allies and countries on the fence of who to side with view this, we hear from John Sidalides, U.S. State Department diplomacy consultant and chief political strategist for Insight. The full episode is available on our partner platform, Epoch TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. See you tomorrow.